Well, hey there. It's been a while since I last touched on a video game adaptation, but the dust has settled around the recently released Five Nights at Freddy's movie, and I want to explain to you why I think this movie is an incredible shit show. What I mean by this is that the film is perfectly goofy, perhaps even a beautiful mess. As a bit of a former FNAF fan, I resonate with the movie more so than your average moviegoer, but at the same time, I wished I wasn't because I can only imagine what someone who had no clue about the franchise was thinking whilst watching. The movie has gone under a bit of critique since release and I want to give my thoughts on why some of it is fair and why some simply doesn't apply. It was clear and obvious from the minute it was announced that it was going to be a miss with critics but a hit with fans and if you aren't already familiar with the story and the lore you're probably going to dislike it. And after watching it, yeah, I think that's the case. I'm certainly not going to pretend like this is a deep experience with a look into the main character's psyche like some are suggesting. I feel like we could have had that, but with Scott Cawthon, he was never going to go dark. I mean, go figure, we were never getting a VHS tape experience, and call me crazy, but I'm glad we didn't. I'm also glad we didn't get whatever the hell IGN thought we were going to get, because what, do you just want Mike sat in his office for an hour and a half trying to survive? Hell no. And to me, this is the first criticism of the movie, which is hard to understand. Five Nights at Freddy's started out as a game that was just pure adrenaline-filled scares, but as the series grew, it became renowned and interesting because of its complex and downright baffling lore. People often criticise Scott Cawthon for creating such a mind-boggling story and leaving it up to the player base to decipher it, but when you think about it, it's genius. Because not only does it leave him a legacy, but if he gave it to everyone for free, then people who read it would just be like, okay, and move on. There is absolutely no way that the series would have grown as big as it did or even got a movie adaptation if all the answers were in plain sight. The reason why Security Breach is often considered the black sheep of the series is because not only is it terrible, but there's no lore or hidden background stories, it's just kind of given to you and yeah I believe that, the fans yearn for mystery. Even the film itself leads a lot up to the audience for better or worse. It's hard to listen to most critics, I don't mean to be that guy but when certain critics give this movie such a low rating and certain other ones much higher, it's very hard to take them seriously. The first thing I will say is this movie gets a lot right. Again, this is me looking through rose tinted glasses of already having read and enjoyed the lore of the series. I'm going to assume that most of you watching already have a basic understanding of the game's story because if not, it's either going to help introduce you to the series or make about as much sense as the movie. This film was Blumhouse's biggest ever, like, movie opening. Now, was it worthy of turning such a profit in its first weekend? Let's find out. As soon as the opening credits played, I knew I was in for a treat, because not only was it using Cawthon's original 8-bit style as a brilliant homage to the games, but it was opening credits. I've never really mentioned this, but I love opening credits. Arcane, Superman, Star Wars, Sam Raimi Spider-Man, you name it. I think it's such an underrated medium, you know how for a sporting event they play the national anthem, that's to get you hyped up to watch some sports, the same way opening credits hype you up to watch whatever it is you're watching. Now let's jump in because I have a lot to talk about. The film does a great job of fleshing out Michael Afton, or is he Michael Afton? Already jumping on the theories here but I want to save that for later. His brother was taken when he was young, now Mike brings himself back to the same dream every night because he believes he saw the person who took him. Now you gotta admit, that alone is a cool concept. It's also the coolest thing this movie does and if I'm 100% honest, I wish that it had more of an impact on the ending and kind of the film as a whole. I feel as though it'll play a massive role in the sequel which by the way is definitely happening. It being Blumhouse's biggest movie opening ever is enough to get a second green light. But back to the plot. And if anything, that's the movie's strong point. It attempts to be a horror film sometimes, but if you came in here hoping to get a blood pumping experience, then you're probably going to be disappointed. And whilst I would say that that didn't disappoint me, it more frustrated me. When you think of a jump scare franchise, Five Nights at Freddy's is one of the first that comes to mind. And whilst I'm not a huge fan of jump scares, believe me, I'm more of a believer in psychological horror and building up tension. Hence why I'm such a fan of Silent Hill and what have you, but if anything, this movie would have seriously benefited from a few more jump scares. In fairness as well, it does try to build tension at moments, you've got the whole Foxy trying to find Abby section which I really enjoyed, especially this little shot of the uh, ghost kid retreating into Foxy, but I'd be hard pressed to even call this a thriller, let alone a horror movie. For Christ's sake, this, boob, this movie's biggest threat is a cupcake, which to be fair, pretty terrifying. Like I was saying, however, the dream stuff is the best thing this film does because not only does it have a good premise, 
but it shows the ghost children as actual threats and capable of murder. Not that you'd know that if you only saw the middle of the film by God It's Goofy. You've got this scene which caused a bit of a stir, it's kind of a bog standard unoriginal jump scare, but in a way it kind of makes sense. In the games the ghost kids are shown to cry black tears, this one here has black tears and eyes, I kind of like it because it shows how much pain the kids are in and how much they hate having their souls stuck inside robot animals because why wouldn't you? If anything, this movie didn't do enough of that. Look, I don't want to use FNAF VHS to prove my points, but one thing that genre does very well is telling just how big a tragedy the whole situation is and why so many people like it. It portrays the missing children as being in constant pain with their souls unable to pass over, what ever that is that comes next. They're never really shown to hate the man who made them this way in the film. Granted, they do when Mike and Abby reveal it to them at the end, but the reason why FNAF 3's ending is so beautiful is because the souls can now finally rest with Afton gone. They've lived in torment for god knows how long, and when that curse is finally lifted, it's nice. But hey, maybe I'm wrong, like I said, the story is still one of the stronger points with the exception of one or two decisions, but we'll get to that. What reviewers like IGN don't seem to understand is that all FNAF fans care about is lore. I seriously doubt there are people out there who are big fans of the series because of its jump scares. If you do, fantastic. But as previously mentioned, the series grew so big because no one had all the answers to the story. Hell, I don't even think Cawthon had all the answers. He just made it up as he went along and is still tweaking it to this very day. I get that reviewers don't have to be fans of the series to review it, the problem arises when they don't understand what built the series in the first place. I don't mean to be getting all, am I the only person who understands this masterpiece on you, but as I've already said and what many others are saying, this film was made with the fans in mind. With that being said, let's go a bit deeper. The dream stuff is good, we've established that. What else is good? Um, Michael's character. I'd say Josh Hutcherson does an absolutely fantastic job, he just screams Michael Afton to me. His portrayal of Mike is extremely accurate, I'd say, even though the only time we hear his voice is in that sister location cutscene, but you could see this version of Mike going through all of that, even though he may be more different than we think. People wonder why he even considered giving his sister up for his brother, but in the games, Michael isn't exactly portrayed as a saint, Pro literally got his brother killed, not that it was on purpose, but yeah, if you weren't familiar, that's the fate Garrett suffers in the games. Again, makes you wonder just how different this universe is, but I have a theory or two about that. Back to the acting. In fairness, everyone does a great job, especially the ghost kids given their ages. I thought Golden Freddy was incredible, he was a right menace. The characters as a whole is another big strong point that this movie has. Some motivations are a bit questionable, especially that of Aunt Jane, who only wants to get custody of Annie to receive checks from the state. What? She looks fairly financially sound to me as is, but I mean, what do I know? Maybe she's broke, but to me, she's just there to be hated and to give Mike a reason to take the security guard job. You know, she doesn't really serve a tremendous purpose. Doug, however, is one of the best characters of all time. On a serious note, we're gonna have to touch on him now, aren't we? That's right, the boy William Mafton. This guy right here. Matthew Lillard is perfect, the absolutely perfect William. I was in love with the casting as soon as it was announced, not just because of his horror history, but I mean, come on, it's Shaggy. <laughs> Seriously though, he knocked it out of the park in the five seconds of screen time he got Jesus Christmas, he was so unbelievably wasted, but given that Scott's MO is leaving his audience wondering and wanting more, I'd assume it's done on purpose. Even though I firmly believe that the film should have used its best asset a lot more, but there's always a sequel to flesh him out and that needs to happen. The emotion he gives William's eyes when he stabs Vanessa is brilliant because he didn't need to do that but it adds another layer of complexity to his character that I feel like was needed. This may sound crazy but you know how when you read Batman's voice you hear Kevin Conroy's voice? When I see William or Michael in sprite form now, I see Matthew Lillard and Josh Hutcherson, that's how much I rate their castings. Lillard brings such a presence to all three or four scenes that he's in, it's so frustrating how wasted he is, but hey, I've already said all that. But how can you sign him on the trilogy and use him as little as this? Now you've got Vanessa. She's a part of the movie that I wasn't 100% on, and I'll tell you why. I do like the dynamic that she has with William, but her being his daughter makes me believe that it is possible that on our hands, we have a Michael Emily. If you weren't aware, William's business partner when he created the restaurant business was Henry Emily. In the games, his daughter Charlotte possesses the puppet after being William's first murder in his car. 
Can you see what I'm getting at? Is Garrett going to be the puppet? I think so, yes. Unless this is all one big mirage and Michael is still William's son and Vanessa's brother and we're going to get some big Empire Strikes Back I Am Your Father moment with Spring of the Trap and Mike, then it takes away one of the best storylines the game had to offer. But regardless, because I might save the theories for another video, Vanessa is one big exposition dump for those who aren't familiar with the games and that's fine, I suppose. But at one point, she's all for Mike and Abby dancing around enjoying the animatronics, and the next, she's like, if you ever bring Abby back here again, I'll shoot you. That's not even like a meme, by the way, she actually says that. The only possible explanation, I guess, would be that she's holding a bunch of contradictory truths. She knows the animatronics are extremely dangerous, she also knows that they're just kids. She likes seeing them indulge in some happiness wherever they can, but I guess she had a snap of realisation when Bonnie's guitar exploded that, well, hang on, that could have killed Abby and decides to stop risking another child's life for some ghost kid fun. Even so though, her character is still confusing and I guess we'll just have to see where they take her. Maybe she indulges in some dream theory of her own when she's in a coma for FNAF 4 style. That whole little section where they have fun with the goofy little robots is a cute one, but causes problems for the film as the tones kind of clash. You've got it trying to be this intimidating place with killer robots, but after this scene, is it just me or you can't really take them seriously? Like I say, it brings a lot of humour, but it felt to me as though the film didn't know what it wanted to be at times. The clashing tones is an issue it faces throughout because you've got someone being bit in half by Freddy in one scene, and then 20 minutes later you've got them all led down staring up at the ceiling like they're on a family picnic. I, I just don't know. Another massive and glaring problem for me was when William says to Mike near the end how he killed his brother, bringing back the whole dream thing and the brother plot that we haven't touched on for about half an hour, and nothing ever comes out of it. Not too long ago, Sid is willing to give up Abby to find out who it was, but after it's confirmed to be William, it's not mentioned. Why? This should have been like a huge thing for Michael, but I guess since he thinks that William is dead, he has closure. Or as William says, I always come back. Gotta love how they shoehorned that catchphrase in there despite it making little to no sense given where we are on the timeline, but hey, if nothing else, it's some neat fan service. Lillard has allegedly signed on for a trilogy, and I don't care, they need to milk him for the next two, a spring trap or not, because you can see his acting experience compared to the rest, no offence, like I said, they all did a great job, but he's a class above. I also would like Emma Tammy to return for the sequel, most of the shots they had actually felt like they had a direction behind it, which truth be told, I was not expecting. It's no secret that this, this movie was kind of rushed to an extent. I mean, at the end of the day, they started filming on the 1st of February 2023, releasing the movie a little over nine months later. That's insane, and yet it came out as well as it did. The love and heart put into this film is very much felt, in my opinion. If you're a FNAF fan, then you'll enjoy this. If not, I can see you not only understanding it, but probably hating it. As I've said, Five Nights at Freddy's is by no means a bad movie. Its main issue to me is the tone awareness and certain things not being executed as well as they could have been. As example, being Afton's death, I would have personally made it more like the game's interpretation and also the way they tie up the narrative leads a lot to be desired. I feel like to an extent this is a good movie to edge young audiences into horror, as something they're familiar with with very few gory moments. We'll pretend that Freddy's scene doesn't exist, but that movie has an amazing production and practical effects which always get me on board. It has a pretty simple storyline if you ignore all the FNAF lore in the background, so there's always that. It was very silly at parts, but if anything, that made me like it a bit more. I certainly had fun watching it, and I think if it was more like the game, then it would have made it a bit less interesting. I understand the dislike in some areas, hell, I've even criticised it myself, but it has its moments, that's for sure, and as a love letter for the franchise, could you ask for much more? Thanks for watching. I wanted to talk about this film a bit sooner than I did, but I wanted to let the dust settle a bit before giving my thoughts out there, because considering it's all anyone's talking about at the minute. It does good things and it does bad things, but there's no denying just how well they capture characters like Willie and Mike and Abby, but some of the side characters fall flat despite solid acting performances, but hey, there's time yet. Let's see how the sequels get on, because there's no doubt they're making one. If you agreed with what I'd say here, or even if you didn't, then feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments about this film. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Or are you somewhere more in the middle? And if you want to see more videos like this one, then please consider subscribing. It really helps me out. And yeah, speak to you soon. I am not leaving this spot! <laughs>